Well, let's return now to the post office scandal and the government investigating ways to speed up the overturning of wrongful convictions of sub-postmasters. Let's talk now to Tim Brentnell. He is a former sub-postmaster and he's been involved uh, in this whole controversy for 16 long years. Tim, tell us your story. Tell us how much money the post office accused you of taking wrongly. Uh, in uh, uh, in 2009, I was audited, and a, a shortfall of uh, uh, 22 and a half thousand pounds was discovered, um, which the auditors uh, suggested um, I should pay back um, to avoid a theft charge. Uh, so I raided my savings, my parents' savings, sold my car, paid that money back, um, and then following that, was investigated and charged for false accounting. What happened then? Well, I was determined uh, to plead not guilty to false accounting because I knew I, I hadn't done anything dishonest. Um, but the post office um, were were so bad at any kind of disclosure. The barrister that I had didn't have anything um, to defend my case with, and advised me that if I if I pled not guilty in in Crown Court, I would very much likely be found guilty because a jury was more than likely going to believe uh, the post office because it was the Crown uh, versus me uh, and I would have a custodial sentence. So um, against my better judgment, I was convinced to plead guilty to false accounting to, to uh, firefight and avoid a prison sentence. So what happened after you pleaded guilty? What were the sanctions? Uh, well, I had a, a suspended sentence for two years. Uh, I had 250 hours community service. And your name, of course, out there as somebody who'd done something wrong. What was that like? Well, yeah, um, you couldn't argue with people because you pled guilty and people would just say, well, you, you, know, you wouldn't plead guilty to something you haven't done. And I don't think, unless you've been in that position of facing a, a custodial sentence, people understand that you, you take the option that uh, you think is going to result in you not having to go to prison. So how did you then clear your name? Well, I then heard um, some 18 months later um, about Alan and his Justice for Sub-Postmasters Alliance. Uh, I gave Alan a call. At that point, he said there were around uh, 30 people had come forward to him. By the time I got to the, the first meeting, uh, there were over 50 of us. Um, following his then uh, he, he, Alan's court case with the 555 of us, um, we were then able to get our convictions overturned. Well, some of us have been able to get our convictions overturned. So, so you were one of those who turned up to that original meeting in the in, in the village hall that we that we saw dramatised in, in in the program. You were ma able to get your conviction overturned. That must have been such an enormous relief. Yes, it was an enormous uh, relief, but it, it was again uh, almost another false start because each time something major like this happened, we were all expecting this story to gain traction, um, and I think. It's taken the TV drama to, to bring it to the public's attention because it's such a complex um, thing that's happened over so many years. Um, a newspaper copy or, or news reports of it couldn't get across the full um, way that how disgusting the post office have treated us over the last 15 years and the huge sort of personal impact it's had on people. And, and the four hours of the drama really brought that into people. What would you say the toll on your personal and private life has been over those years? Well, massive. I mean, a, a fraud conviction uh, stays on your, your criminal record forever and you have to declare it whenever I apply for jobs. So I, I never even got to interview stage for any kind of meaningful employment since then. Uh, it is very hard to get things like insurance when you have a, a fraud conviction. And obviously, um, being hard as a, as a fraudster or a thief massively affected the, the retail business that I was trying to run as well and, and that business has closed since as well. And rebuilding your image, I mean obviously the newspapers would have covered the story when you were convicted, they're not quite so ready to, to put your face on the front page and cover it when you've been cleared. Yes, no, it, 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 it's very sensationalistic that when, when, when you're charged or convicted, it, it makes good news and sells papers that uh, uh, a so-called thief has been caught or, or, or punished. But especially when you have a conviction overturned, it, it's, not, it's not reported as widely. Do you feel that your name has now been cleared? Yes, I mean, I, I had um, 
uh, a large sort of uh, local outpouring of, uh, of apologies and, and sympathy when my name was cleared back in, in 2021. Uh, and again, this last week since the drama, lots of people have come forward and, and been very, very nice about it and apologetic. What compensation have you received so far? Well, as, as someone with an overturned conviction, I was entitled to a, a small interim payment, um, but that isn't even 10% of, of, of what a total claim would be for someone in my position. And the, the, the annoying thing about the minister's statement yesterday, uh, they talk about 2,500 people have been compensated so far with, with so many millions of pounds, but the, the vast majority of that would have been uh, what, what they would call low-hanging fruit, people with small claims for monetary losses. Uh, people people with overturned convictions, the, the vast majority of us haven't had any kind of meaningful recompense yet. So no real compensation yet. And what has it cost you, would you say, in terms of, of financial losses? Uh, well, if, if you take into account... Uh, my my lost income as a sub postmaster and then the the loss of business over the last 15 years it's hundreds of thousands of pounds and the loss to you as a person your sanity your good name possible to put a price yeah, I, on that how, how do you put a price on that i mean I, I myself have been diagnosed with an anxiety disorder um i withdrew from from society and family for a number of years had a a, a marriage breakdown um, people in my position, many more of them, people actually had custodial prison sentences. Uh, people have lost homes, businesses, entire families, and, and you know a number of people have taken their own lives. So how how does any amount of, of compensation uh, begin to start to put those sort of things right? Is there anything that could be done? Do you think to correct this injustice? <laughs> I don't think any any amount of compensation would ever correct it, or or and any kind of um, seeing people held accountable would, would ever fully correct it. Um, what really needs to happen now, though, is, is things need to speed up because uh, all of us with quash convictions have been waiting two and a half years for something to happen. Uh, and when government and ministers talk about speeding things up, it's like, well, you know, we've already been waiting that large amount of time. Things really need to be be uh, expedited. I mean, I'm still in the middle of my life. Many people in this scandal took on post, of, post offices as re retirement jobs or plans and are in the autumn years of their life. So we really need to get this, this compensation to people that, that are due it. Tim, you seem really calm about all this. I imagine there have been points in your life where you've been anything but calm. You must be still so angry about what happened to you. I'm incredibly angry about what's happened to me and everyone else, but it doesn't really serve a purpose getting angry. We, we, this has gone on for so long. Um, the anger's been, been tempered because it, it's just turning into a waiting game. Well, Tim, Tim Brentnell, form, former sub-postmaster, wrongly convicted. Really interesting to talk to you and best of luck with your ongoing fight and, and hopefully... Conversation for you and those that you know will be coming through sooner rather than later. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.